Welcome everyone to the first spring workshop uh, of the Eurobotics Club in the spring 2021 semester. Uh, this is called How and Why to Use ROS. My name is Bennett. Um, and just to start out, please note uh, this plan, although not feasible, I think it's an interesting example of how, um, I don't know, it's kind of, I found it amusing. The robot was clever enough to find this path and I was not clever enough to tell it, that doesn't work, you're too wide. So let's look into why that exactly arose. First off, um, this workshop, it's useful to have some C++ or command line experience, um, just so you understand code examples and whatnot. And as we're running through things in the command line later, um, just knowing what's going on is of course helpful. Uh, we also have three kind of questions this workshop works to address. Why is ROS beneficial for robotics software development? How does ROS software development actually work? And then just look through an example, how do we apply these concepts in some concrete way? Um, and thinking through these concepts, not just abstractly, but like, what does this look like in practice in some example? Just to start out, my name is Bennett. I'm computer science and linguistics major, EC minor. My current year is junior. I'm also the president of the Eurobotics Club and an undergraduate research assistant for the Robotics and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory on campus. There, my research investigates efficient algorithms for mobile robot trajectory planning over complex terrain. Um, and we use ROS quite frequently in that work. So uh, this is definitely something I have some experience with. So what is ROS? Why do we care? Um, let's first talk about the conceptual challenges of robotic software development and then how ROS solves some of these. So first off, think of the most naive case possible. How does a robot cross a room? We need a bunch of things to happen. We want to sense the room. The robot should update its model of the room and where it is within that room. We should maybe identify goals, like what are we trying to do? And then develop plans to actually reach or execute these goals. And of course, execute those plans in a safe manner. Um, now, this on the right here is kind of a visualization of what the most naive version could do. We throw all this stuff into one file and we do it step by step. Let's sense the world, then let's plan, then let's control our motors, and let's jump over and do the entire thing again, repeat. Um, but kind of obviously, you know, some of these things are way more important than others. Safety and doing things, you know, actually thinking about what you're doing is far more important than maybe updating some model of the room that didn't change very much in the last second. Um, but at the same time, you know, some of these things change different amounts. They change with varying, I guess, frequencies and time. Um, and sequential execution really just ignores all of these different aspects. To kind of break apart what these different problems are, the first thing we might wanna do is parallelize our code. We could do this over multiple machines, or in many cases, just using multiple cores on the same machine. Um, that's one way to just speed things up and in general, make our system be more robust to the world by responding more quickly. The second step might be actually allowing processes to work asynchronously. Uh, for example, let's say we have some, some planner, we don't actually need to plan until we have a goal. And once that goal has been sent off, this node over here, you know, we don't really care. Once the goal is sent, that thing can go and die. Bye. Um, and just to the point of thinking about these things, not in terms of chugging along, always doing the same thing, but like something tells something to do like other processes. Um, not everything needs to happen at once is maybe the point to take from the slide. The third piece is, you know, maybe using a different planner. Um, if we've written our code in a kind of mature way, we can hopefully reuse the code in other projects, but also maybe replace our code with something maybe professional or someone um, we trust dearly has implemented, rather than trying to do everything in the world from scratch, um, writing code that can use you know, other resources is often helpful. And the final piece, I haven't really talked about it, but you know there are all these arrows in the picture. Someone needs to set those up. Um, and the process of defining these communication protocols and making sure everything kind of works cleanly and all the arrows are the right color, that's kind of annoying and tedious, and it'd be nice if Ross maybe could do that for us. And what do you know? It does. Um, so Ross, the robot operating system, is a collection of tools, libraries, and conventions that are going to facilitate the development of complex robotic software. Um, Ross is open source. It's collaboratively developed worldwide, um, and it's often used throughout research in both academia and industry, um, especially on campus here with Professor Howard, for example. So concretely, Ross does a few things for us that are very nice. If we're using ROS, we obtain standard ways to define the plumbing between the various components of our software stack. We also get clean ways to compile, run, and debug these pieces without as much headache. And finally, we get some pre-implemented implementations for free um, of various helpful functionalities, such as visualizing things or defining messages um, that we often want to use. We'll see some examples of this. Uh, so we have the idea of why does ROS help us? Um, maybe the next step is how does it do so, at least conceptually. Um, and ROS works this idea of nodes that are going to communicate through topics, and the nodes can either publish or subscribe to these things, as we'll see. To start out, I don't know why I made this a quote, 
but a node is a process that performs computation. That's kind of it. So each node is going to sit there, perform some task on the robot software, and together these nodes form a graph of computation um, via these little arrows that are going to be topics. Um, each topic has some name, uh, you know, often they're named what they're kind of sending. So cost map or planners queries, uh, a topic shares data of some specific type. Uh, so maybe a cost map type or some sort of query type. Well, again, very obvious examples. Um, but oftentimes uh, multiple topics can kind of send the same data type. And so the names can often be informative of what they actually are. And finally, the way nodes actually connect into these sort of streams of data is to choose to either publish or subscribe to various topics. Um, in terms of what's going on on those topics, a message is kind of each piece of data that is sent on some topic. Uh, just check in the chat. Thanks, Fran. Now, uh, the message, of course, needs to match the data type of the topic. Uh, messages are typically constructed of named type fields. So if you're familiar with C, C or C++, um, these are kind of just structs, you know, objects that sort of have data members, but typically no functions because that's kind of reserved for classes. Messages can also be predefined types uh, from the ROS ecosystem, or you can define your own types. Um, concrete examples and try to open those up. So the first of these, a geometry messages pose. Um, the way these kind of messages are named, we have a package and then it kind of what data type we're working with. In this case, a message that is a pose is comprised of a point in a quaternion, um, each named some sort of you know identifier you want. And then you can look into what each of these things are. Geometry messages is a point is composed of X, Y, Z. Each of these will be doubles in C++. Um, next piece is actually a nav messages path. This is just kind of illustrating how these things connect together. This is some separate package in the ROS ecosystem that's called nav messages used for navigation. Um, and you actually can see a path is composed of some sort of header object that just gives some documentation information about the message. And then a series, or at least an array of pose stamps which are effectively poses as we've already seen. And then this header file again, um, really not file, but I guess data member. All, all the point of this is these data uh, objects are composed of other data objects and kind of building this hierarchy of these different um, data members, you end up building fairly complex messages, uh, but never having to write too much at once. Uh, final piece, how can we write our own messages? These are two examples from the Navbot project. Uh, we can make a path, and in this case, we just chose to use an array of geometry points. We called it points. And a second example, a planning query, it's going to have some starting point and some ending point or goal point. And basically, this tells the planner, like, where are we now and where do we want to go? Um, and that's kind of what the planner ends up reasoning over. Jumping back here, how do we use these messages? Well, publisher and subscriber relationships. So a publisher is a node that's going to send messages onto some topic. A subscriber is a node that receives messages sent on the topic. Um, and just kind of to clarify, you know, topics can have multiple of either of these things and the nodes can both publish and subscribe. They can do both, neither, kind of whatever you want. Um, but this is how we build that graph and actually build those arrows out. Um, so kind of thinking back to these arrows, uh, maybe we had some LiDAR sensor. It's communicating via some topic called laser scans with a data type laser scan to some sort of mapper node. And then the, maybe the mapper sends out cost maps. Um, we can sort of indicate what package the cost map data type is from using the slash, um, or rather, sorry, the topic is under the map mapper package. It's cost map name, cost map object, and it's being sent off to the planner, et cetera, et cetera, the graph builds on. Um, so that's at least the ideas. Let's actually kind of look into how do we write these things? How do we implement them? Um, and also like we're writing software in what space, in what language, in what way are we writing these things? Um, starting point, setting these things up. So to install ROS, uh, you typically are using Linux. Um, this is just kind of the standard, I guess, operating system used in robotic software development. Um, multiple distributions of ROS are supported at one time. So as you're installing ROS, you can choose one of these three and then your OS from the installation page and then follow the provided instructions. Um, just to give a concrete, like this is the link, this is the page you end up going to when you want to install this stuff. Um, Kinetic is pretty old. It was released you know, five years ago at this point and isn't supported in about a month. Uh, meanwhile, Melodic or Noetic, kind of the two newer ones, uh, often uh, in installing the newest, especially if you're starting out, um, can have some downsides like Noetic because it was only released last year, 
has some sort of outstanding bugs potentially, or at least it's under tested. Whereas melodic, um, oftentimes, like the middle of the three distributions, I guess, it's been around a bit longer. And so if people had questions, they're kind of more rolled out by now. And if there's certain documentation, it's going to be specific to ones that have been around longer. So I guess that's all to say, I would recommend installing melodic if you're starting with ROS, because it's going to have that documentation built up, but at the same time, not be too old, that's going to be defunct pretty soon. Uh, kind of just a balance as you're working with software that changes over time. So what if your machine isn't Linux? Most of ours probably aren't. If you're working on a Mac, I would recommend VirtualBox. Basically, you can install some software that creates a virtual machine, um, which then sort of runs a new operating system on the same machine you're already running. Uh, Parallels does this, but for a fee, uh, they allow you to sort of do both things at once. Um, so for example, if you're on Mac, you know, I have all these apps on my sidebar here. If I was using Parallels, I could throw like Windows apps or Linux apps onto that sidebar right alongside my Windows. Um, whereas with VirtualBox, it's sort of separated in its own, in its own container, I guess. If you're working on Windows, um, ROS does actually support installing onto Windows directly, but I would not recommend this in the slightest. All the documentation tends to be on Linux. These are kind of experimental installations. And again, just going with VirtualBox is probably recommended. So if you see the Windows on the installation page, I would uh, steer clear. So we installed ROS hypothetically. To actually test if it worked, you can run ROS version D. Uh, this kind of tells us what is the distribution installed on a machine. If the command works, installation worked. If it didn't, it didn't. Um, but this can just debug pretty quickly. The second command that's important here is ROS core. Um, as you can imagine, this is kind of going to be the core of ROS. So to start this up, run the command. And this will be the central program that's going to allow all the nodes to communicate. And it needs to be running if you want ROS to work. Um, so always, I guess, keep that in mind as you're trying to run ROS software. Make sure you have ROS core up. And if you don't, it'll pretty quickly say, like, can't find this. And uh, you'll remember what to do, hopefully, then. Um, as you're developing ROS software, you're going to be inside of some sort of workspace, which is basically a directory within which the code is written and then built. Um, and there's a specific set of commands to set this up. So you basically need to create a directory for the workspace, just has, has to have some folder to exist in. And then inside of that, create a source directory, SRC, um, under that parent directory for the workspace. Um, move into the workspace itself, and then you can actually just run the command cat can make, and this will create uh, what was just a folder and turns it into basically a ROS workspace or a cat can workspace um, within which there are a bunch of, as we'll see, files that connect together to help build the code and make everything run nicely, whatever, whatever. Basically, this command is all that matters here, but it's a lot of pieces behind the scenes that I don't even care to know. Um, once we've done that, we actually end up with two new folders for free. Um, we have the source, as we mentioned, this is going to be where we place our code structured into packages. Uh, the build folder is going to be where CMake, which is sort of the process that makes or builds our code. Um, this is where CMake is invoked and it builds all the stuff as we're compiling. And then Devo is just going to hold the built targets. And um, once we actually run to run the code, it's going to be run out of the development folder here. Um, I mentioned the word packages. These are simply how we organize our software. They're meant to be reusable. So whatever's in the package kind of stands on its, on its own as some sort of conceptual object. And then a package might contain related ROS nodes, or it could be some ROS independent library. Um, what I mean by this is you could write an entire C++ library, don't mention ROS at all, and just have it be in some package. And then later on in some other ROS package, you could actually plug into the ROS nodes and plug into all the parts that actually mention ROS. Um, and this kind of allows you to use sort of C++ libraries that don't even involve ROS at all, um, without ever actually having to like edit them, um, at least internally, to work with ROS, which is nice. Um, you can also just have random files and whatnot. Basically, anything you want to access, if it makes sense as a package, feel free to make it a package. To create these, again, one command. Um, if you're inside the source directory, run catkin create package, whatever the name you want, and then any dependencies. Um, and this just helps because uh, if you put dependencies here rather than later on as you're creating the, I guess, make file, um, if you know the package is going to depend on stuff, putting it here now, I guess this command will set things up in a way that you have to do less work later and we'll leave it at that. Uh, less work is typically nice and that's kind of what a lot of these tools do. So what does a package look like? Um, we're very close to actually writing code now. Um, so we're inside some example package and this is just a way to like illustrate the file hierarchy. At the top, uh, there's a cmake list.txt, and this is going to facilitate compiling packages. Um, this is going to be that file we have to edit to sort of help all the dependencies shuffle out. And if we put our dependencies into the command right here, this like starts up with the dependencies like more handled than they would be otherwise, which is nice. 
We then want some space to put all of our header files. And typically you do an include folder and then whatever the package name is or the library name down here. And then any header files, you could have multiple. If you have any launch files, they go inside of a launch folder and each of them ends in dot launch. We'll talk about what those are. Finally, at least in terms of like actual files we care about at the top level, package.xml is the documentation of our package. So it defines various properties, who is the maintainer, who is the developer, when was this made. Um, oftentimes this is somewhat neglected in amateur projects, including mine, but technically, you know, filling this out would help people understand what is this package, what does it do, and who do I email to complain about it if it doesn't work. In the final folder, source, this is where all the implementations of, of both nodes and source files will go. So we can put all of our node files here and any library implementations down here. Um, basically, this include folder and this package name folder down here, these sort of line up one-to-one. -one. So the header files are up here, the source is down here, and now let's talk about what those two things actually are. So in C++, there are two parts to writing a function or a class. We have a declaration and a definition. When we declare a function or a class, this is all that the compiler needs to know about how the thing is going to be used. And then the definition actually fills in how these pieces are implemented. So declarations are enough to tell how the function can be used, as I said, um, but definitions kind of, they do, this, they do the main part of the code, I guess you could say, where like the single line that describes the function tells us nothing about how it is implemented, but it does tell us literally everything we know about how it's used. Um, and all it is to say like header files contain just that piece. So header files store these declarations for a library so they can be used and imported wherever they're needed. Um, and these end in a .h typically as files. Uh, so for example, we could have this function. It just has this single line in the header file. And then we look into the source file and we're going to fill it out by actually telling it, like, how do we implement this and what are we actually returning? But this signature it's called is all you actually need to use the function. Like as you're calling it, if you know it returns this and does this, as long as it's the right types, you know, you're golden. Um, so that's the idea and distinction between headers, fi header files and then source files. In terms of writing header files, there are a few things to consider. Um, first, looking at example is probably informative. So this is just an example template file. Um, doesn't actually implement things for real, but sh shows like what the syntax looks like in C++ here. So if we haven't defined this header file yet in the namespace, we want to do so is kind of what this says. This basically makes sure all the definitions only appear once but they do at least appear once and that's kind of, otherwise they don't exist and people can't find stuff in other packages. If we're going to have other dependencies, uh, oh, um, typically over the entire library, rather than just the header file, you want to put them here. Um, so if you use C++, you know, throw all of your includes into the header file rather than each of the source files. This just keeps everything consistent and avoids either duplicate or um, missing dependencies. And then finally, any message types, including raw stuff, um, you want to put up here as well. A header file then is going to declare some class and then it will end. Um, inside of this class, we have public and protected data members. Public ones are those that can be accessed by other classes. Um, the class then wants a constructor and deconstructor basically to create or destroy the class. We then want to have some sort of callback functions or message handling functions. We will go into what these look like or how these are used. But basically these are like what Ross is going to call when we set up a subscriber. So we had some subscriber that's going to be on whatever this data type is, and we plug this function into the subscriber, Ross runs this function once the subscriber receives that message. This will be in some slide later as well. Um, and finally, any other data members that we want to be public, like Ross publishers or constant values that we'll need to access, we can throw these in. Otherwise, it's just a Ross, or sorry, a C++ class. So we can have protected data members that include any internal functions for whatever you need, um, other data members, and then um, naming things starting with an underscore is typically going to indicate like these are private, only this class can access them. Um, and that's just like a idiomatic thing that doesn't have any meaning, but it's kind of helpful for programmers to understand what can I access elsewhere and what can't I. So kind of going back into what were the points there that were really important. As you're about developing a header file, it's important to consider what are the functions that the ROS node will use? Like what are the message handling functions how are those being used to get what we need into this class and get out of the class what we need? Um, similarly, what are those callbacks? That's another name for those, I guess, effective functions. What data members are public or protected? Anything that can be protected probably should be, but again, matter of taste. And then any dependencies throughout the entire library, make sure to put them at the top level just for kind of clarity. For writing the source files, these are going to contain all of the stuff we just talked about 
but actually for real. Um, so the implementation to back up the header file. So implement everything promised and you're kind of good. Um, these are often more simple because like, if you did all the thinking correctly in the header file, you already know what you're supposed to do here and you just do it. Um, but of course, you know, actually writing the code part is, I, I guess also a task, they're different challenges. Um, so you need to include the header file you're going to be defining stuff for, great. We have a constructor, deconstructor, and finally, all the functions as we promised. Um, this is, again, looking at an example of what these helper or handle functions look like. Um, the simplest type can store the message locally. So we could index, uh, like our this, this left side of the equation here, uh, this is some sort of data member of the class, and we can index out of the message what we want. Um, we could also have other data members that are like sub constituents, or I guess, sub data members of the message. Um, and we can access those and store them as we want as well. Um, handlers can also kind of do whatever else you want. So you can call their functions, you could tell, hey, planner, go plan and publish something afterwards, um, kind of whatever you need. But uh, these functions are typically you want to just store stuff and um, you'll then use it later on as you're doing some sort of loop. We'll look for examples again. And then finally, other classes, uh, other class functions, I guess, implement them, make sure they are correct typically. Um, this is the main place where you can mess up, but you know, write out C++ code as you would and make sure everything in the helper uh, in the header function is completed. Uh, the final piece, just left this as a note to remind myself, you can include other things you want in the source files. So the header file just tells us what is everything that's available externally to the class. But if you need other functions that aren't tied to the class just to create certain functionalities, that's totally fine to add them here. Um, kind of just remembering this is just a C++ file, and so you can add any C++ you want. Um, just a, a useful note to remember. Now we are finally into ROS node. So this is the part that's specific to ROS and not just C++. To set up a ROS node, you're going to want to make sure to include any header files that you need, including message types. You then begin some sort of main function, because these are sort of the executables of uh, ROS code. Um, so it's going to be int main, args, whatnot. Um, begin the open brackets of the main function. Inside of that, you're going to initialize a node using this command. Basically, as long as you've included ROS um, as a, from the header file, you can call this initialize function that starts up the node. You just pass in whatever the node was given, and then you can name it whatever you'd like. And finally, to access the node handle, um, you just typically write this line out, and then you'll call this later on to set up publishers and subscribers. The node handle is kind of, I don't know, it gives us just an object within the code to say, add publishers, add subscribers, add whatnot um, to plug this node into other things in the ecosystem. Here's an actual example. So we want to make a publisher. This is what it would look like. We already have the node handler, as we saw, and we can then write ROS publisher. We call it whatever we want. It's going to be the node handle dot advertise some sort of data type and then some sort of arguments. So let's break this apart. Uh, first off, the function arguments here, we have the topic name. So whatever we're publishing to, we need to name it, identify it. We can also have the publishing queue size as an integer. So this basically says, if messages are published faster than they can be sent, um, how many messages should we store in a buffer before we throw anything away? Um, so you can imagine, you know, we had a really great planning cycle and it went really quickly, but we didn't yet publish the last plan we had or whatnot. Um, Uh-oh, do we sit there and ignore it or do we publish both and later on, um, you know, deal with them on whatever subscribers we have? These are kind of design decisions that you end up thinking through. Um, but for now, one is typically fine because we just say, if we didn't publish the last one, throw it out and do the new one. That's what one would mean here in this case. And then finally, the true here is just the latching argument. Basically, should new subscribers to the topic receive whatever was last sent? So when latching is on, the last message that was published is saved and automatically sent to any future subscribers that will connect to the topic. Um, the final piece, we just have this generic parameter which is kind of defining the data type of the topic. Um, and this kind of angle bracket syntax you might recognize from Java, similar in C++, just going to indicate the type of the topic. To set up a subscriber, it's arguably a bit simpler. Um, Ross, the object is a raw subscriber called sub. Take the node handler, uh, node handle dot subscribe, and then we give it a name, the queue size again, and then some sort of callback function in the object. So again, the topic name is just a string. The queue size is the same idea, but for subscribing instead of publishing. 
um, the callback function is going to handle the messages of the subscription, um, as we saw in the source code. And then we're going to pass a reference to a particular object with the function, um, which is typically an instantiation of the library class that we already implemented for the package. Um, there are, I guess there are other ways you could do this where you effectively put the class inside of the node file. Um, all I should say for now is this is a reference to some object. And as long as the object is of this class and this is a function that exists under it, um, you can use that callback as you'd like. Um, but that's a kind of a, there's no point of bringing it up now. That's just like an advanced design decision that says we want to put all the ROS code in the node files rather than the source library. Um, and that's a consideration way down the line. Finally, deep breath. Let's look at some examples and just really practice like what do these things look like in terms of we set up the publishers, we set up the subscribers, how do we use them? There are a few things that often show up. The first option, we could sit and wait to receive stuff to process. So we kind of set up the, all the subscribers up and we're just gonna sit and chill out and kind of eat up what we, uh, what we get as, as time moves on. Second piece, you can uh, kind of workaholic it out. You turn away updating some state like a simulator and constantly publish out the new results all the time. Uh, the final piece, uh, kind of, I guess, a Hail Mary, you do one time publish and you exit. And these will give examples of what happens after all that syntax we saw is, so let's take a look. The first of these, let's call it sub and spin. The idea is we set up our subscribers and then do nothing. The way we do this is this raw spin command. When you call this, it keeps the node running, just waiting for messages. When a message is received, the appropriate callback function is called to handle the message. And then things will exit when the node is manually closed or killed. Um, so this is just the last line in the file, basically. And then we just chill out and you know wait for messages. Um, and this is actually a rare case where there's like a perfect example from real code I've written. Um, this is from Navbot, and this is the GUI class here. So as you mentioned, we're going to include the GUI um, header file, uh, which is going to like declare the type of class we're defining down here. We're inside of some main function. So create the arguments that we care for the GUI. In this case, we just needed to tell it the robot's diameter in meters. And we create that object. And now this is just a GUI object called GUI. Thrilling. We initialize the node. I called it GUI. We get the node handler. And finally, we set up four subscribers. Each of these kind of the syntax is the same. We just called it something different to kind of be clear. We get the node handle dot subscribe. Each of the topic names are just like, where are we grabbing stuff from across the different um, Navbot channels and topics. And we give the reference to the callback function that was defined in the GUI class. And we give it the reference to the GUI object as we just declared. Um, so hopefully this kind of instantiates what that looks like in a real example. And finally, we just like the GUI publisher um, is inside the class. I called it marker pub because it's publishing these visualization messages that are markers. Um, and basically this is just going to do some stuff with Arviz that we'll talk about that helps us visualize um, what are all the things it's subscribing to in terms of like actual 3D images and whatnot. Um, as a just general tip, you want to maybe sleep after you set up all your connections. This kind of gives Ross time to set those things up and get them fully ironed out and working. Um, and then you do whatever you want. In this case, just spin, wait for messages, and later return once Ross uh, kills the node. There's that example. The second example, um, I just put it in the slides itself. We're going to churn away updating some states and publishing the result. So in this case, we can create a ROS rate object. This basically is a way to just set up timers that are going to use real time, like wall clock time, rather than CPU time to uh, estimate how long things are taking or how to create loops of certain lengths. In this case, we could a timer that is going to be 10 Hertz. Um, so this indicates Hertz rather than seconds or anything. We, could, we start a while loop. As long as ROS is okay, basically, as long as the road hasn't been shut down, we're going to spin once, which is like a mini version of ROS spin. It just does it once. So like check for messages and move on. Um, don't like, you know, we don't stay in here. We move on into this. We're going to step our simulator or object forward. Um, in this case, let's say the step function takes in some sort of time because we're at 10 Hertz. Let's use a 10th of a second. We step it forward in time um, and have some new state of the world. We then publish out maybe whatever the object's new data is that we updated. And finally we sleep. Um, using this ROS timer so that everything kind of happens at a consistent frequency. Um, real example of this we'll see is in our simulator. If you want to simulate robot motion, maybe we do it every tenth of a second. And we can kind of say, given that we're moving at this speed for a tenth of a second, where will we end up? We do it over and over and we constantly publish the results so the entire system knows where is our estimate at. That's the idea. 
the final piece, arguably the simplest, uh, just to start our system off, we'll publish once and then we'll exit, that's it. Um, so we could create the object um, for the message, whatever the data type is, we fill in its fields as relevant and we're going to publish it, that's it. Um, again, sleeping for nice, uh, just, <laughs> just to help debugging basically, and then we exit. Um, and that's the idea there. So those are header files, source files, node files. That's kind of how to write the code. Obviously all of it's in C++, some of them might be new, but those are the ideas and those are actually how we implement them then. How do we make this code um, into something we can execute? That's what building will be. Uh, we start off with the idea of compiled languages. So we've written C++ code and we want to run it. Two steps will need to happen. Uh, first, you actually compile things. So a compiler turns the source code into an executable written in machine code. And then we're going to execute. Uh, we can tell the operating system to execute the machine code to basically run it. Um, and this is kind of where the word build, com build comes from, I guess. It means to compile the code, but not to run it. So um, we build the code and we store it away in the workspaces develop directory. Um, and we can later call it. Uh, but there's the intermediate step where we wrote things. And then there's a step to compile it and it just sits there in a compiled state and we'll later run it. Um, and this is just how compiled languages work and it's probably a useful, I guess, concept to understand. The next piece enables us to do this. It's called cat can make. Um, cat can make is a convenience tool that's going to allow us to build code in a cat can workspace or basically the workspace we set up using cat can workspace create or whatnot, uh, we way slides back. If we follow the conventions of cat can, uh, we can end up compiling the ROS workspace uh, kind of for free, as long as you set things up right. And the way we set that up is cmakelist.txt. This file tells the build system uh, how to build each package. So what are the dependencies? What are the libraries we need to build? And what executables should we generate? And here, executables are going to be our nodes because those are the files we actually run. To edit cmakelist.txt, um, it's kind of a boring process. I'll, I'll share these slides and basically I have a link here to a document I made for myself a while back. Um, basically, we're down here. Um, you need to edit this file and tell it all the stuff you wrote, all the like dependencies and files and executables you want. Um, but it's kind of just a series of mechanized steps. It's not very exciting, certainly. So if you follow the steps, they're probably better guides than mine, but this one has gotten me pretty far. Um, you follow the steps and you end up with cmakelist.txt updated. Um, again, basically telling it what are the dependencies, what are the nodes you'd like to build, um, if you declared C++ libraries, where are they implemented as well? And then if you've created any new message types, you need to include a little blurb about that. Finally, we're ready to build the workspace. So if we did that, great. Uh, we can build things using these steps. We move to the top directory of the workspace. Again, you might remember we created that source as we were building it. Um, and you can run the command cat can make, and this just does everything you'd want. If there are errors, and often there are, uh, you need to fix these, fix these up before you can run the code, um, but otherwise we are ready to run. Um, I try to highlight kind of implicitly throughout the workshop, like what are the often stumbling points for like making these things work. Uh, doing like the cmakelist.txt file is incredibly tedious. Um, and that's kind of why I made that guide for myself as I was taking the class uh, with Professor Howard as I was doing research. Um, like these things are kind of tedious um, and I've also hopefully somewhat mentioned many times, like when do we include dependencies and header files? Where should we put the dependencies? Um, all these include statements in our, in our code. Um, these are annoying things. These are not exciting things, but they often are what causes these errors. So that was the goal there. Um, sorry to harp about that, but yeah, it, it saved me a lot of headache to learn these lessons over time, I guess. Uh, finally, let's run some code and, you know, get on uh, to actually debugging things because just because things compile does not mean um, things are actually going to work as we want, as we may see. To start out, we need to source the built packages using this command. Um, this basically tells, um, we're inside the terminal, of course, this is going to bring our nodes and launch files as well as other ROS commands into the shell namespace. And we can then run our code in a few different ways. Uh, but without running this kind of, the shell doesn't know where to find things, I guess we can say. And so we need to run this first typically after, um, after you run cat can make every time. To run a single ROS node, um, you can use this command called ROS run. Uh, to start out, start up ROS core in some terminal tab and that opens up ROS. And then you can do control T, open up a new tab, uh, resource things as we saw. And then we're going to start up a new node. Um, and we run ROS run, whatever package it's in, and then the name of the node. 
and this starts that node up. You can then kind of create a new tab, do it again, however many nodes you want. But you might imagine, you know, this isn't a very efficient way to do things if you have 10 nodes to start. Um, and so there are helpful ways to get that happening all at once. Um, it's helpful. And yeah, the important part also sometimes is the entire system is brought online at the same time. Um, so if certain parts depend on having information available, um, you know, they can't run without those other parts. And so why would you ever launch them and not together? And this is where the idea of a launch file comes in. A launch file is going to be an XML file that specifies some group of nodes to launch, including any necessary parameters. And we can use ROS launch to start all the nodes in that file at once. Um, you just place these files um, in some sort of launch folder inside the relevant package. Um, if you remember way back to like what the package looked like, this is one of the folders at the very top level of the package called launch. Um, and just here's a concrete example of what that looks like. This is the main launch file for Navbot currently. Um, these ones are, let's ignore these. <laughs> um, here's what each of the items in a launch file looks like. We say node, we say the name of the node, um, whatever we want to call it, and then whatever package it's from. The type here is referring to whatever we identified in cmakelist.txt. Um, and you might notice later on here, find an example, like you can name the node something different than the type of node that it is. Um, this is just an important point in like, if you wanted to start multiple maybe planner nodes and see which one was faster, but they all have the same type for some reason, you can name the different things to create, or I guess avoid conflicts, otherwise you'd have them. And so no, ROS does not support microcontrollers. Um, it runs on Linux, like at some point to have, like you can imagine all these processes are going to run on different threads. Um, there are microcontrollers that can run ROS, but behind the scenes, they are going to run Linux. Um, I guess that's the answer to that, yeah. Uh, an example might be like the NVIDIA Jetson Nano, um, which Navbot is currently working with uh, this semester. So we had the launch file to actually use it, set things up using the source command, and then we ROS launch and we say what package is in and call the file. Um, and you don't actually need to include ROS core here, which is nice. ROS core um, is started automatically if you use ROS launch. Um, so one fewer step for us, which is always great. Um, there are then three, three more examples here of just, here are some functionalities that help us debug things. Um, going into these in depth is probably overkill for now. Um, basically the idea for ROS node is we can get debug information about nodes. So we can list what nodes are active. We can check if a node's connected. We can kill a node. We can kill all the nodes. Um, or we can get information about what a node is publishing and subscribing to. Um, you know, as you're running ROS, uh, looking back on slides like this and this uh, are probably more helpful than me saying it now. Similarly, ROS topic gives us debug information about topics. So list them, find information. Um, echo here is also like often very useful where we can print all the messages being sent onto some topic um, in the command line and just make sure like what we expect to see is actually occurring. Um, and just kind of a side note, for most of these commands, you can learn more about their options by just running the command without any arguments. So if you just run ROS topic, it'll tell you what all these things are and how to run them. Um, so it kind of avoids having to look up references in cases where you can just run parts of the command. Final piece, RQT graph. Um, this is just kind of a nice way to create figures and get an idea of what the system is doing overall. It's going to visualize the connectivity of our ROS nodes. So when the nodes are active, you can run RQT graph and produce figures like this. Um, there's not much point in going into details, but at this point, hopefully you can understand like all of these things in ovals are our nodes and we have topics that are connecting them. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't show the types, but uh, like at this point through the workshop, we, we do understand like what each of these things is doing, um, how it could possibly have been, have been implemented. And then like these topics, are each sharing data of some type and together it's going to form the computation that creates the robot's behavior that we want. Okay, that kind of closes the abstract uh, talking part. The next part is a concrete talking part of the workshop. Um, let's look at an example, uh, talking about occupancy grid mapping, which is a probabilistic approach for creating simple maps of the world. Check our time, pretty good. So let's look at our task. Uh, let's explore some example system focusing on the ROS node relationships rather than the internal algorithms. Um, and I create a few assumptions just to make this simple for us. Let's say we're remote controlling our robot and it's driving around indoors. We also have perfect odometry information. Um, basically, there's zero motion noise, which allows us to perfectly predict the robot's motion, um, given that we know how it was commanded to move. 
the final piece is we have, we have a LiDAR sensor on top of the robot. And our goal, we're going to map some building um, and hopefully do it in a way that's actually useful for robots. Um, so for example, creating a map with semantic tags um, is often not as helpful as maybe creating a map that tells us where can we drive and where can't we, just as an idea of like what this map might look like. Uh, so for our sensor, let's talk about LiDAR. Uh, LiDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. It's an active sensor which outputs pulse lasers to measure the distance from the sensor to the nearest obstacle in each direction. Um, in this case, on the left, we have a simulated version of this where um, using effectively basic geometry, um, we can cast out a line from this robot and kind of guess where does it hit each obstacle at each angle in the world. And we end up with um, a set of points that tell us how far away every direction in the world is. Um, and similarly, in the real world, uh, we can do things in coal mines, I guess. Um, this is just a figure from a great textbook called Probabilistic Robotics. Um, often lasers do have like a range at which they're not effective. And so that information will be included in the data type we end up defining for this here. Um, so we have our sensor, like let's create a node to connect it into the ROS system. It's going to publish laser scan objects to some topic. Um, what might the laser scan object look like? Well, let's say we want some sort of double that tells us how far is it between each angle or each laser um, in this LiDAR scan. Um, we also have some sort of time step and this just describes how much time passes between these laser scans. Um, if you imagine the robots moving very fast and like as, as the scanner spins, um, it's like it, the robot moves a non-negligible distance um, over the course of the scan. This information can help us sort of account for that and like integrate back in time to think where were we when we sensed this thing, which is a weird question to ask, but like these are the kinds of things you end up needing to think about. And hopefully like maybe it helps make clear like why, why, we, why do we need ROS? Because robotics is that complex. We need to think about where we were 10 seconds ago in order to use that information wisely. Like it's tedious and annoying stuff without ROS. Um, final piece, most important, like how far were each of those laser scans going? Um, and so there's just an array of distances measured by each laser. Um, and I did not make this idea up. Um, this is actually another built-in type in ROS under the sen sensor messages um, package. Uh, there's more pieces here, but I've kind of covered the important ones where like, uh, here's the idea. I mean, like you, you could define your message that just had these pieces. Um, and that's also kind of always a balance between, ROS gives you these types that are sometimes very extra, like, come on, it's overkill. Um, but it's also nice to not have to write code, even if it's three lines, just to set this type of message up. Those are the kind of balancing decisions designing, uh, I guess designing ROS code requires. Second piece, we have our LiDAR node. We have some mapper node as well. And this is going to convert those laser scans into a grid-based mapping, um, which is going to represent the probability that each cell of the world is occupied. Um, so we chop the world into some grid, and we say, how likely is it that each piece of the world here uh, contains something. Um, and this gives us an idea of how expensive it is for the robot to drive over that location. So this node is going to subscribe. We need to like eat up the laser scans and process those into the map. And we also need some way to uh, have the robot state, basically like where is the robot? What is the robot's current pose? And this will allow us to project those laser scans um, into the global frame. Um, if you think back, like these laser scans only tell us how far was anything from the robot and so we're going to need like a way to put that into the, the world's space because um, geometry, I don't know, like uh, formally, formally I'm not explaining it here, but uh, we need both of these things for that reason, I guess. The final piece, the mapper is going to spit out a map, imagine that, um, and that's actually all the relationship this piece needs, which is nice. Um, to have that state, which we've kind of said we needed, um, we can have a simulator node, and this is going to provide some internal prediction of where the robot is. Um, and I kind of made this easy for us. We can assume zero motion noise, and therefore we can just sort of take the controls that the robot was commanded to execute and project them in time and see where we end up. And this will actually use that publishing loop uh, paradigm that I mentioned, like I think the second example of the types of nodes we often see. Um, so, you know, we'll sit there and we'll constantly update the robot state, I guess, using the current motion command. Um, and we project forward in time. So to get that motion command, we obviously subscribe to get it. 
Um, and this is going to come from you know, our remote controller. Presumably, these commands were going to the robots like wheels or motors, so we already had them accessible. Um, and so the subscriber here can just grab them and get them for the simulator as well. Um, a representation for this that is common is linear and angular velocity in the robot's local frame. Basically, how much do we drive forward and how much do we turn? And another data type here, geometry matches just twist, includes two different ways to define these velocities in a consistent way. Uh, final piece of this is the publisher. We're going to spit out that state that we computed, and uh, we can often represent that as x, y, and theta, which is our heading. The final note of these, we just want to visualize everything we just talked about. So we subscribe to anything we want to show, and we show it. Um, we can do this using Arviz, um, which is a 3D visualization tool for us, and this is going to draw everything that we've set up. Um, and Arviz works by publishing marker objects, and then it's going to look like some sort of ROS node um, that's running Arviz is going to listen to those topics and uh, plot them accordingly. Um, most of the stuff you'll want to learn about this is just on the main page. If it, well, if it were to load, um, I've included a link to like where you can learn more about that there. Um, so that's all of the content. We'll get into an example actually showing these things, um, but I just wanted to mention the few less resources, at least in the slides of where I would point to to learn more about these things. Um, EC232 is Autonomous Mobile Robots. It's taught by Professor Thomas Howard. Um, I took it last spring and it basically covers all of this and way more. Um, and it's definitely an informative class if you want to do robotics research on campus. Second piece, Ross Wiki. As I mentioned, Ross is open source and developed by a lot of people. Um, and so a lot of the documentation about any of these pieces I've talked about will often show up here. If you aren't familiar with C++, I have a link here to the source I learned um, using last I guess last spring semester. Um, this is kind of short, but it was enough for Howard's class, which is uh, arguably more than you'll ever want to learn about C++. Finally, piece, um, I don't have it next to me, but the Probabilist Robotics textbook is a great resource for a bunch of these algorithms, um, especially because I kind of glossed over them for the sake of time and the sake of maybe conciseness as well. Final, final slide. Um, we've explored various aspects of ROS software development, focusing on the following three questions. We know them, we talked about them. Um, and I'll then move into a demonstration, just kind of illustrating these things, illustrating how to set up the workspace, how to, um, like how, how can you create a source directory that has other people's code? How does that work? Um, but that is the end of the slides there. Um, I'll take like a bit of time to, I think transition over, but that should be it. And I guess, no, the screen still wants to record. Okay, that one has his mic still and I'm over looking into some other uh, screen here. So this is just the Navbot code. Um, I'm just going to clone this from scratch because it's, uh, it's probably the most straightforward way to like just create a new, a new space to work in. Uh, so let's start out. Let's create, uh, create our workspace. What was that looking like? Uh, so we want to make the directory to contain the workspace. Um, call it example workspace. I might already have one, so I'll call it example workspace one. We create that, and we want to create that source directory inside of it, just so that the cat can make can build things accordingly. And example workspace one, good. So we're in here, we run catkin make, and it does everything. I'm skipping the exciting terminal printouts, but it's just building stuff great. Um, and if we look, which I'll try to, we can then actually see a bunch of stuff on this machine, but what was it, an example? Yeah, we have this new workspace and it created these new folders for us, which we kind of want. Um, and you might notice like there's already a cat can make list that text in here that it fills in for us once we run cat can make. Okay, so we have that. How do we get our navbot code into there? Um, I do it like this. So we're gonna to wanna to navigate inside of that source directory. Uh, we're at the right level. We're basically going to replace the source directory with um, whatever Git repository we want to clone. Um, because like, if you kind of recall, the source directory was the main part that we ever actually cared about um, kind of building all of our code, writing all of our code out. Um, if we replace the source directory with another one, um, we can end up 
kind of just having all the code we want, yeah, of course, um, kind of for free. Name, source, let's see if that works. And yeah, we're now inside, I just want to rename this to the right thing. Okay. Let's check if that works. We're just going to rerun the same command uh, to kind of make all that code. I just copied a bunch of source. Let's now build it into uh, whatever. And does it work? It looks like it's working, which is probably good. I should have tested this more beforehand. Uh-oh, missing fun printouts. Um, basically, you know, Kekin does all this stuff for us. Every one of these steps is one we would have had to write ourselves um, if we weren't using this tool. So hooray for not doing that. Um, the Navbot package, uh, or I guess the Navbot workspace has many different packages. Um, it's going to mention a bunch of these here. Um, once we're running it, I can show like the full graph and kind of show what the system is doing. Um, but I really am just like copying in the code from GitHub and it's following kind of the, I guess, format that I explained throughout the workshop. Uh, final piece, um, once this is built, I'll source the stuff as I mentioned, and then there's a launch file. Hopefully it works right from the get-go. Um, and yeah, that would be the system running kind of from scratch, quote unquote. And yeah, I probably could have thought ahead and like I have a version of this that's already built. Um, doing it live is a bit slow. Uh, if there are any questions, definitely a good time for that. Um, yeah, and I do feel weird not looking at the camera, but two screens. All right, 95. All right, gonna be the fastest source devil setup bash. Yeah. Okay, and we should be able to launch what we want. What do we want? I think it's in a simulator package that we have a file called sim.launch. This was the file that I showed as an example launch file as well. Um, let's see if it works. Hmm, it does not. And I can actually guess why. I probably didn't kill all of the nodes last time I was testing this earlier today. So let's kill everything. Great sentence. Yeah, so if you run ROS list, like ROS node kill all enough, it says there's no more things to kill, which is exactly what you want. Resource things. Let's check now. That's better. No warnings. Uh, before, let, 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 let that load first. Uh, first piece here, we were in the launch file, and it kind of tells us these are the nodes I'm going to start, and it starts those. Um, and each of those gets a new process ID and gets started up. We have our Arviz node as well that's going to uh, eat up whatever markers the GUI is sending. Um, just to kind of show some of the, I guess, commands that I've listed throughout this workshop, um, this is one you often want to use just to like see what is happening currently. So ROS topic list, it's listing all the topics that are currently active. Check our time, yeah. Um, so these are like all the different things that are going on inside of the Navbot uh, architecture. If I do a ROS node list, you can see all the nodes that are running. It should just match whatever was uh, started up here. Let's actually look at like what this is doing um, in Arviz. So this is how Arviz looks. Um, you can look around, oh joy. Um, on the left here, important part, this is like all the stuff we had to set up. Um, so each of these is a type of object and we kind of say like, what topic should I subscribe to to get this data? Um, so I'm sending out all the markers from the GUI via this visualization marker topic um, to get our laser scans, a uh, bunch of settings, but I'm using the topic called scan. Um, and close that. You could if you, okay, whatever. <laughs> Where is it? There. Finally, the map. Um, it's some sort of mapper map class, and uh, it has some information about like the map is offset by five meters and five meters in two directions to make it centered. Um, overall, let's actually try to make this new stuff. So I've set it up so that you can publish a point from Arviz and this goes to the planner. A um, bunch of steps happen and we end up with some, some plan and then it follows that plan. Um, this is how like all the figures I've generated that look like this um, kind of came to be. Um, now, there are a few issues with the current implementation like as I kind of showed in that first slide, I'm not actually C space expanding things. Basically, like the planner will cut as close as possible without considering how big the robot is to obstacles. Um, you could fix this because the robot has a circle by like expanding um, all of the cost areas by some certain radius. Um, that that is arguably a simple fix that I should have done before this workshop, but uh, I was working on the slides um, and also midterms. You know how it is. 
Um, but th this is really what the system looks like. So we're publishing a bunch of markers that create these objects. The cost map is some sort of flat layer underneath all this stuff. All these white dots are the laser scans being like simulated and then published live. Um, and actually, if we hide everything except for that map, we can see like this is what the occupancy grid map actually looks like. Um, and so although these obstacles, like the, the orange cylinders, these are all simulated, obviously. Um, the cost map generator doesn't get access to these things. It's just kind of using, based on all these white dots, uh, what areas of the world do I think are occupied and which are not? And we end up with something that looks like this. Uh, so that's the system. Those are all the concepts that went into it. Um, that's an example of how you would build the system, how to just install, get stuff from scratch. Um, and yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's about it. Um, yeah, I like. I could talk about Ross for far longer than this, but that is all the stuff I wanted to cover. Uh, thank you all for your attention, um, and I think I'll stop the recording there. Stop it while I'm ahead. <laughs>